Psalms, chapter 120. A song of degree. Now, I got a, a Schofield Bible of notes. And there's a note here. And I'll read you the note. Literary of essence. Like a step. Perhaps chanted by people as the, perhaps. I mean, you're making notes and, and lessons in a Bible that perhaps, then be quiet. You don't know, you have an idea, then just keep your writings to yourself. It is better for a Bible student, and I mean anybody who wants to learn the Bible, I'm not talking about people going to college and all. I'm talking about anybody who wants to sit down and learn the Bible. It is better you you say, I don't know, than try to come up with some nonsense that came out of nonsense. It's a song degree. All right, if it means as sense, okay, that's what it means. But just take it with the fact that perhaps chanted. You know, if I went to a doctor, and every time he did medical tests, I sit down at his desk, I said, Doc, well, what did, what did the test say? Well, perhaps you may have this virus. Perhaps you may have cancer. Perhaps, you know, you may have a broken bone. Perhaps, I would say, perhaps, doctor, I need to go find somebody else because you don't know what you're talking about. Now, the Bible, the King James Bible is inspired. Schofield notes and whatever your notes you have of what your Bible and commentators can be okay. But the notes are not inspired by God. Some people can't say, I don't know, because, I don't know, maybe pride or something. What's a song of degrees? I, I don't know what degrees are. I can, I can give you a definition degrees. I can tell you it means steps, moments of time, like degrees on the sundial as you found in the Bible. But chanted while they went up to Jerusalem to the feast. In my distress, My, well, it can be singular, it can be a group of people. My distress, I, individual, called on, called, excuse me, cried unto the name of the Lord, and he heard me. So, with, like Psalms, many Psalms are, we've got a distressful situation, we got trouble, we got a problem. We got an ailment. And here we're going to see enemies in a moment. And the Psalms is one thing that gets to you is, hey, you know what? I'm a child of God. Whether Old Testament, Psalms, right? Or a Christian, New Testament. And as a child of God, I can learn the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there's going to be distresses. There's going to be troubles. There's going to be problems. And if anybody from a pulpit, from television, from a radio, from books, whatever, teaches that the Christian life is going to be wonderful, great, and grand, and hallelujah, all the time, is a phony. David had many distresses. Paul had many distresses. All 11 of the apostles minus John, 10 of the apostles of Jesus Christ, died a violent death. When you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and you got, I don't think it's the first chapter, but when it opens up in the very first story is about the apostles and how they died, and it moves into the men that we know from the Bible, Silas and all them. They had distresses. 
the greatest verse that we use today for soul winning is, what shall I do? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Paul and Silas are in jail because of the word of God, distress. I'm a born again Bible believing Christian. I go out in the streets. I preach the gospel. I pass out gospel tracts. I study my family. I, I, I do these things on video for people to learn the Bible. I, I got a, a cyst in my ear. I was talking to my pastor a couple weeks ago, uh, maybe a little bit later. We were talking about the, these, these, these healers. And then they will turn around. They will blame you for your lack of faith. For the trouble or distress you have. Or they'll blame you for your lack of faith. Because you didn't get healed. They had enough faith to come to the moron to get cleansing. It's just a moron couldn't have the power of God or anybody to cleanse them. Deliver my soul. And that's the eternalness of you. And remember, an Old Testament saint did not have the circumcision of the soul and the flesh. It was always together. Now today, as a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, a child of God, adoption through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, I have had a spiritual circumcision that my soul has been cut away from my flesh. And when my flesh sins, and it does, my soul is not affected. That the day that if I were to die and the Lord tarry, this sinful flesh is going to lie in the grave. My soul will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips. People are lying about me. That's what this, the psalmist is saying. I, I, listen, I love the Lord. The Lord hears me, verse 1. O Lord, there are people lying about me. And it's sad enough, Old Testament, New Testament, that some of the liars can be Old Testament saints, and they can be Christian. And you would think that by that statement, oh, that's only the world, and people, you know, no, it's not only the world. I've been saved since April 25th, 1987, and believe me, my times of being saved, about 33 years, maybe 34, I have had plenty of Christians lion lips i've had plenty of unsaved people with lion lips and from a deceitful tongue the con to deceive deceiving and lying according to john 8 44 is the work of the devil what on earth are these characteristics amongst Christians? I know a, a man well in the ministry. Popular in the ministry. I won't say his name. And he deals with books and he deals with CDs and cassette tape. And he said one of the strongest people that he does not do or will not do business with no more is the Christian because they have deceived him. And I've heard from a well-known, a few well-known preachers and teachers of the Bible, King James, saying the Christian have been the liars and the deceitful ones. That ought not to be so. Now, that's not what the psalmist is saying. We don't know if it's the unsaved or, the, or, or those that are the children of God in the Old Testament. But I'm just making a point here for the Christian, the application, because we can apply some of this in, in Psalms 120 to the Christian. And I want you to know, I don't know how young you are or how old you are in Christ, but there are going to be Christians and there are going to be worldly people out there. They're going to lie and they're going to deceive you. If I had a nickel for every time I heard a preacher 
say they borrow, they 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 did not borrow. They they lend money to a borrower in the church. And you know, Pastor, I'll pay you back. And I've heard this story over and over different pastors. And they never paid it back, I've heard. I'm not saying all, I didn't say all. some do. That's sorry. Now we're all prone to lie, but we shouldn't have to see. Lying can slip out that moment when you're 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 putting confrontation, something that and that question and that, that lie may be the first thing to come out and to break the prize to turn around and say, listen, you know what? That answer I gave you, I lied. I'm sorry. I was scared, whatever it was, but you know. But deceit is to just actively going out to say, you know what, I'm gonna lie, I'm gonna trick you. I'm that's not right. What shall be given unto thee? Now, would you think that's God? Shall I bring a lamb? Shall I bring a goat? Or what shall be done unto thee? God? Do I bring an ox? Thou false tongue. To thee and thou there is not God is the tongue. What shall be given unto the tongue? What shall be done for the false tongue? And James speaks about the, the lying tongue and the lying mouth and the lying lip. That, you know, listen, I can go to a zoo. I can go to a circus. And I can see the elephants do tricks. I can see the lions do tricks. I can see tigers and bears and dogs and monkeys. And I can probably even see some birds do some things. And I can go to the zoo and see all kinds of animals do things for food. And yet the tongue set on the iniquity of the fire of hell. Deliver my soul, Lord, from the lion lips and from the deceitful tongue. He's not talking about himself. What shall be given unto thee, not God, what shall be done unto thee, not God, thou false tongue, the one who's lying about him and the one that's deceived him. What shall be given to you? What do you want? The writer of Psalm is saying, listen, they're wrong. It's John 8, 44. It's the ways of the devil. And the, and the psalmist said, what do you want? What do you want? Why do you got to lie? Why do you got to deceive me? Just tell me what you want. Sharp arrow from the mighty with coals of juniper and this is fiery arrow these are those arrows that you know they, they put them in the juniper they, they wrap it up they, they put it in the fluid and they set it on fire and then they launch them and we read i believe it's ephesians about our armor that we have a shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the devil The devil's in verse 2, 8 John 8, 44, and our, our shield of faith to quench, not, it doesn't say, you know, the, the shield of faith shall stop the fiery darts of the devil. No, it's not going to stop them. It's to quench them. So verses 2 and verses uh, 4 is the devil attacking the man of God of the Old Testament. Paul tells us through our armor that th there's the devil that attacks us. And one of the things that Jesus says is lying. And when Jesus said that, he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. Religion. You know what I mean? Lies. I'm not going to tell you how many churches I've been in. And I'm not talking about churches I've been a member of. I'm talking about churches that I have visited once or twice or a few times. 
You know how many times out of that pulpit I heard that man or even woman, more so for a woman lying, denying the Bible. I, I've been in the church where a woman's been in that pulpit. And you know how many times I've heard that person out of that pulpit, that podium, whatever they want to call it, come up with lies? There's a great one I learned when I went when I went to school during my doctorate. Yeah, it's called Baptist stories, and I've heard plenty of them. I, when I first was a saved Christian, I've heard the story. Like, wow, that's a great story. And I moved to another church for whatever reason, and I was hearing the pastor tell the same story. Like, deja vu. And I moved to another church for another reason. I hear the pastor tell the same story. Like, where are these? Are these three guys in the same spot? Well, it's a story. It's an illustration. But when you put your name, you put it that it happened to you, you're having it to be a lie. And I know pastors right now, they will lie from the pulpit to get a ha-ha, he-he, everybody laugh with me. They're lying for... To get attention. I'm glad to say I'm out of that church. Fiery darts. Fiery arrows. That's from the devil. When, when Pilgrim comes up to the gate. And it's the very first gate. I forget what the name is called. But it says. Um, Knock and you shall enter. And the man that's on the other side. Opens up the door and yanks Christian. And yanks him right to the doorway. And between a couple of. Arrows come flying at him. And Christian's like, whoa, wipe off the what would you do that for? He says, You see yonder castle? I said, Yeah. You see those arrows? Whoa, yeah. That's the enemy. He's trying to kill you. And he says, Many have been struck and dead. And later on, when you read of Christina and her children, the boys and the maid, when they go through, there's also a dog. And again, Paul tells us that the devil has fiery darts and we have the shield of faith. The psalmist is writing, I'm being attacked by the devil, John 8, 44, and then about our Christian warfare. I believe it's Ephesians. Now, I'm going to say this over and over. It is so sorry for somebody who doesn't read the Old Testament. Because there's so much in the Old Testament. Look, we're 120 chapters into Psalms. Haven't we seen the glorious coming of the first advent of Jesus? Have we not seen some church age doctrine? Have we not seen Jacob's trouble? Have we not seen the second coming of Jesus Christ? Have we not seen the millennium? Have we not seen heaven? Have we not seen the angels? Have we not seen all? You can't have the Old Testament without the New, and you can't have the New Testament without the Old. They're all one book. You know when, when Paul, many times, and Jesus, many times, you know when they went to the synagogue, the Bible says they go to the synagogue, they listen to the service, and I guess somehow my reading is at, at, at the end of the synagogue, sir, the, the, the rabbi would say, anybody got any statement? No church would dare to do that today. And Jesus and Paul politely would stand up. And they would say, well, gentlemen of, of the synagogue, I take open your, your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 3. Well, Jesus could have done that. Galatians wasn't written. How about Jesus saying, okay, Everybody open your open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of what? All right, open it up to Luke. Who's Luke? How about later? How about open your Bibles to the Gospel of John? No. At no time could Paul deal with, with the Jewish people that he dealt with multiple times or deal before the Senate of the Jews and, and Romans 
closing the book of the book of Acts. Okay, okay, let's go to the letter I wrote to Timothy. It's not there. And when Jesus and Paul and Peter and James and all the apostles, when you look in the old in the New Testament, you find the scripture runs back to the Old Testament. When Jesus was with the two men to the road of Aramitha, I'm saying that name wrong, correct me. He said, once he, he said, Come come with us, Jesus, sit down, let's have some food. And he, the Bible says he opened an ledge of the scriptures. Friend, that wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That was not Romans, Galatians, uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the book of Revelation. They weren't written. That was the law, the prophets, and the poetry book, which one of them we're reading right now. And Jesus told the men and women of his time, if you search the scriptures, you will find me. And Christians say, I don't read the Old Testament. Then you haven't found Jesus. Psalms 120 verse 2 is the devil, Jesus saying, John 8, 44. And then the fiery arrows, the fiery uh, uh Darts, verse 4. Well, that runs you right back to Paul talking about our Christian uh, uh, shield of faith. And it says the mighty. Who's the mighty? The devil. Job said, hey, do battle with him and don't do it again. Remember. You've got to get in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Jude, and all the way through. And I know some of it's hard. Listen, the hardest book I have in, in the Bible to read through is Numbers chapter 7. That's hard. I get a quarter way through, the, through Numbers chapter 7, and I start thinking about things I want to do that afternoon. And I get halfway through, wait a minute, i got to go back. i got to read this. Every word of God, Jesus said. Every word of God. And he's quoting that to the devil. And there are people who think, well, I don't read the Old Testament. Well, that's not every word of God. We have an enemy, verse 2 and verse 4, and the enemy would love to be pleased for you not to read the Bible. And then yet people go about, I've got great faith. No, you don't. You don't even know where faith first shows up in the Bible. It shows up with Abel. He says, verse 5, woe is me that I sojourn. That's a temporary dwelling. Sojourn would be somebody, they're, they're, they're in their car, they're going somewhere. Oh, it's getting late. It's, it's, I'm too tired to drive anymore. Okay, there's a motel. Go in the motel. I like to have a room. You go in there, you get your room, you sit up, and you take it. You sleep all night. Then you pack up your bags, you turn the key into the, that's soul journey. And it may be one night, it may be two nights, it may be three. It's, you're not going to live there. I journey in Misha. That I will, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. Kedar is Ishmael. Kedar also has a reference in Antichrist. But Meshach and Kedar are not in the promised land written by a Jew. Psalms 120 are pretty much all written by Jews. I am not in the land of God. Where am I? I'm in the enemy's territory. And what is happening in the enemy's territory? They're lying to me. They're deceiving me. Now that's a perfect Christian example that you can take. We are living in the world. And Jesus said, no, not the world that hated me first before it hated you. John says, marvel not, my brethren, know that the world hates us. Know you not the world hates. 
The world hates those of Jesus and those that follow you. And we Christians are living here. We're not living here. We're soldiers. We're pilgrims. And many Christians have moved in, have settled in, and I'm American, and that's the... You haven't read Psalm 120. And what are your great people, what if all your worldly ends and Christians doing? They're lying and they're deceitful. And what does the psalmist, a man of God, says? Woe is me, I'm living here. If the psalmist would have ever had heard the song, this world is not my own, I'm just a passing through, he would have wrote that down right here. And his state for the Israelite is he's not in the promised land. He's out of the promised land. The Christian's not in New Jerusalem. He's out of New Jerusalem. He's in a land that he is sojourning. And we are here for the purpose to preach the gospel to every creature. My soul has long dwelt with him that hateth peace. And who is that? That's the people of Meshach and that's the people of Kedar. That's your modern world today of the Middle East. Your Arabians, your Arabs. Your Jordanian. All the people that surround the nation of Israel. They are an enemy of Israel. They are lying about and to Israel. Israel is truly not in his homeland yet. He's all over the world. Now I don't know what the percentage is of how many Jews are in Israel and how many Jews are outside of it. But there are Jews living in America today. And woe to me, I sojourn in not my promised land. And it'd be Poland, it'd be Russia, it'd be wherever they are. And they're not going to be gathered up and they're not going to have that peace until Jesus Christ comes and sits on the throne of David and rules forever and ever as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you know there'll be no more lying at that point. You know there'll be no more deceit of the tongue because the enemy of God and Jesus Christ, the devil, is chained for a thousand years. And when he's loose for about a season, he is cast in a lake of fire that burns forever. I am for peace. Paul says, pray for the peace in Jerusalem. My prayer is, Lord God, please hurry up and bring the Antichrist. Lord, get us out of here. Sometime of the Antichrist, before the, the four horses of the apocalypse, the church is gone. And then as soon as the Antichrist comes, as soon as we get that seven years ticking, and as soon as we get them seven years of Jacob's trouble ticking, the, the sooner the seventh year will come, and all the, the, the calamity, the book of Revelation and Daniel, and, and the prophets speak about the, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's harsh, but as soon as we can get that time going, God, and we can get that seventh year, when you tell Jesus to mount on the horse and the, and the Christians to mount on the horses behind Jesus, go and get the nation of Israel at the seventh year, then that will bring the peace of Jerusalem. I am for peace. That's the writer. That's Jesus Christ. But when I speak, they are for war. United Nations, Middle East, the Arabians, the Ishmaelites, who are Arabians. Even the great America herself. America will defend Israel as far as he can, but don't interrupt with the goat with the oil that America gets from the enemies of Israel. 
Don't interrupt America's peace plans with another nation if Israel has to interfere with that peace talk. Because America's dealing dealings with the enemy of Israel. I mean, if America wants to side with the Catholic Church and an ambassador to the Vatican, the Vatican and the Catholic Church is against the Jew. Israel's like, we want peace. And the whole world says, well, we want war. We want your property. Here, give up a little land. Okay, here, here's some land. Give up some more land. We're giving up more land. Come on, give us peace. Well, give us some more land. And they're not going to get that peace until Jesus Christ comes and picks them up and delivers them as Joshua did into the promised land. There is no peace, save the Lord, save the Lord unto the wicked. That's, uh, that's Psalms 120. Ezekiel said that. There is much to be learned in the Old Testament. Until the Lord comes, until the rapture, we are to, to pray and go in all the world and preach the gospel. We're to pray for the nation of Israel. We're to help those Jews as much as we can. Lord God, let's get the Antichrist here. Let's get that seven years ticking. So as, as soon as we get that seven years ticking, we can get the seven years over with and we can get Jesus on the horse and bring him back in God's time. It's all God's time. But Paul said, let's pray for the peace in Jerusalem. You know what the peace of Jerusalem is? What, what Paul believed, Jesus Christ coming back. The writer of Psalm 120 said, hey, I'm a Jew. I'm not even in my proper property. I want peace. Everybody around me doesn't want peace. That's because Jesus hasn't come yet. 